do we know we exist? Could we be a simulation? Could we be controlled by some strange god or aliens? How do we know we're living a physical life? Are we living in another realm or plane of existence? There are so many questions around reality. So on this episode of the Insomni Cut Show, we're gonna cover consciousness, near-death experiences, the physical aspects of our brain that affect our consciousness, and even the evidence that suggests we are in fact living, as well as some opportunities for doubt, and even the potential that we're not just living here. All right, so Brian, I have a question. Sure. Do you think we're actually here? I think we're here and we're connected to a whole bunch of different places at the same time. So like my dad insists that we are being controlled by aliens mm -hmm. and there's we're some people, just like a big game. Yeah, there's some people, there's the alien ant farm theory, right? Some people believe we are an alien ant farm, just like a kid would have an ant farm. Like we've all been placed on this Mm -hmm. planet to like a giant experiment right? right to go populate or create so people can see you know aliens can see how creation works right or things like that uh -huh. some people believe that other people believe it in a real scientific way where they're saying like life was on meteors right and then it was it hit the earth and then that you know that was the seed for you know life so there are many ways to look at that alien sort of ant farm theory or if you want to say populating the universe so, I mean, the thing that I struggle with is like, oh, you know, and it's something that we talked about even during this episode when we were talking to some of our guests was really like, well, if we're thinking it in our mind, isn't it our own reality? And so, you know, I know that back in the 18th century, there was a philosopher, George, oh, what was his name? George Berkeley. And right. he actually said that the only things that actually existed were, were the minds that had the ideas, right? So, mm -hmm. like, my question is, could our realities just be the ideas that we create. So we can have any reality we want. But if you think about what Socrates said, right? There is some sort of true reality, right? He said, in order that the mind should see light instead of darkness, so the entire soul must be turned away from this changing world. Okay, so the world is always changing. Think about what he's saying there. Until we, until its eye can learn to contemplate reality. So at the end of it, there is some ultimate reality, but because the world is changing so much, what is that reality in the time that it's happening? Right, but at some point, there is some ultimate reality out there. I can see that. I mean, I also can see the other end of that. I mean, I really think I gravitate more toward we do create our own reality. Isn't that what we tell everybody? Like you make your own destiny, right? And I mean, isn't that just another way of saying it? Like, and and I think that it's great when we spoke to um, the psychic medium, she was really um, talking about having the different, like you and I are having two different realities right now. My reality mm -hmm. is that I'm, you know, a 33 year old woman and I'm sitting at my desk and here I am talking to Brian and my dog is barking at the solar panel guy. And, and like, this is my reality. Your reality right. is, is different, right? But yeah, you're right. There is that ultimate reality that we're both like here living and doing this, this right here. Right. Mm -hmm. Is that mm -hmm. kind of the same thing? Yeah. I, I think what it, it's, it's saying is, okay, so, so much of our reality. So let's separate our reality and then the universal reality. Right. Mm -hmm. Let's just separate those for a second. So you're talking about your reality and that's what sort of matters to you in the current moment or most people. Right. But the re the reality is there is some ultimate reality. Like, I don't know if you just look at it from a scientific point of view, like at some point, something is what it is, right? It, it's made of some chemical compound. Just because you say, no, it's not in my reality, gold is now some other compound, it doesn't mean it's another compound, right? So I think that's what's saying, ultimately, there is some reality out there, but we're living the world in our own realities. And it's changing all the time. Like that reality is always changing. It's not stagnant. So I believe we create our own reality and your reality isn't my reality right now we're communicating with each other but we're having two different realities and if you look at like some of the ancient philosophies they would say everything we're experiencing is maya this is all illusion we aren't really here if you want to get deeply into it 
So Brian and I didn't just wake up one day and decide like, are we really here? We never, you know, we're not the first people to question that, you know, this has been something that's been questioned for a long, long time. And so where's consciousness? Like there are some factors to consider consciousness, um, the brain's role in consciousness, you know, how those play together to really tell us if we're alive. Yeah, and it's something that's uh, been, you know, philosophers and scientists have talked about for, you know, probably a thousand, at least a thousand, maybe more than a thousand years uh, about uh, how does something like the brain generate consciousness. And again, as I mentioned, some people do not believe that the brain generates consciousness. In fact, for the past, uh, for about uh, seven or eight years, I've actually traveled to India. Uh, I was invited and I've, I've been part of a program that teaches basic neuroscience to Tibetan Buddhist monks and nuns. And Tibetan Buddhists do not believe that the brain generates consciousness. Uh, they believe that something material like the brain cannot generate something immaterial like consciousness. Now, what exactly it is, um, they've tried to explain it to me, and uh, I guess I'm not uh, smart enough to understand uh, some of the concepts that, they're, uh, that they believe in. But there are some people that believe that, uh, I guess the ancient, the, the older concept would be a dualism, that the brain and the mind are separate. Um, how that results in the mechanism of that and how some consciousness can be generated by something other than the brain, I don't quite understand. I'm, I'm more of a materialist or a reductionist. I'll readily admit that uh, because I know that if you change brain structure, if you change brain anatomy, physiology, pharmacology of the brain, you change consciousness. So how do we define consciousness, right? I mean, consciousness really refers to our individual awareness and our unique thoughts, our memories, our feelings, our sensations, the environment around us. Essentially, our consciousness is our awareness of ourselves in the world we're, we're in. But what happens when we're not in a conscious state? Is that still reality? My wife and I decided to go on a cruise. We'd never been on a cruise before, and we decided to go to the Baltic Sea, which I wasn't sure where it was, but we found it. And we visited St. Petersburg and Helsinki and Tallinn, Estonia, and all kinds of places like that. At the end of that cruise, I got sick. So we were in Oslo. Uh, and the first day in Oslo, I started getting sick. Second day, I was very sick. We flew home from Amsterdam the next day on Tuesday. And Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, I spend in bed thinking, well, you know, I'll get better. And it was getting worse and worse. By Friday afternoon, I decided I needed to go to the walk-in clinic. Now, in Canada, you have walk-in clinics um, as part of the public health care system. Anyway, I went to the walk-in, and they wouldn't let me in. Uh, they took one look at me and said, we can't help you here. Go directly to ER. So I did. When I got to the emergency, you know, most emergency rooms, you expect to wait an hour or two, maybe even three, depending on the lineup and the urgency of people coming in. In 10 minutes, I was in a private room. I didn't even know they had private rooms in the ER. I only knew the little curtain sort of separated rooms. They were pretty frantic about inspecting me and doing all kinds of stuff. And that let me know things were pretty significant. They told me right away they were going to, uh, in, you know, let me in the hospital, admit me to the hospital, and then kept coming back every hour or so telling me they were looking for a room. And after a while, they told me they were going to probably put me in intensive care. Uh, they told me I had, a, at a minimum, a horrifying case of pneumonia in both lungs, but that there was something much worse wrong and they weren't sure what it was. By this time, I'd sent my wife home. Joy, her name's Joy. She went home because we have dogs and cats and she needed to take care of them. I was going to be admitted to the hospital, so there wasn't really anything else she could do. So I kept going back and forth. Eventually, I was put in a room and the doctor came in and said, you know, we're probably going to put you not only in ICU, but biological isolation. And that means caps and gowns and double doors and airlocks and that sort of things, like the, kind of the plague from Mars. And they did, or they were going to, they told me all this. And then the final time, which now with all the time gone by, it was probably 11 at night, the doctor came in and asked me a question you never want to get asked in the hospital. He looked at me and he said, uh, do we have permission to intubate you or do anything we need to do to preserve your life? 
And I looked at him and I said, what? And he, you know, it was a terrifying question because it meant that was that serious. Anyway, so uh, I went into meditation. And meditation is a practice I've had since I was a teenager. After being in meditation for a while, I could feel my body and my spirit, the energetic essence, whatever we are separating. So I could feel a sense of separation there. I don't know how to describe it other than it was like Velcro, it didn't make any noise, but it just felt like two pieces coming apart. So I, I decided I'd I guess I'm dying. So I sent Joy a three-line text. And I was trembling at this point. I was really in bad shape. And I sent her three lines. The first line said, I see you. Second line said, isolation slash intubation. And the third line said, I may be dying. She didn't see that because she'd gone to bed, which was what she was going to do and come back the next day. About 2.30 in the morning, she got a call from the hospital, which was the call you never want to get. And the nurse said to her, uh, are you coming? And then she saw my text. In the meantime, I had crashed a crash cart. So they had rushed me to intensive care and I was in restraints and in a coma, which lasted for almost three weeks, two and a half weeks. Um, and sometime during that night, my heart stopped. And so I died. Uh, at that time, and I was in a coma, so I didn't know that till later, but they told me that. At that time, I came to, uh, energetically, I was in a gray room, which I couldn't see the walls or the floor or the ceiling, but it was kind of that photo card gray, kind of a very soft gray. And I was horizontal, like I was on the, the, the hospital bed. I looked over my left shoulder and over to the left, I could see a door, a doorway. It didn't have a door in it. It just looked like a regular door. And I had a desire to be at the door. So then I was at the door and I was leaning on the door jam on my right shoulder. Across the door jam, uh, the other side of the doorway was white. Now the light wasn't streaming through, it was just white on that side and gray on this side. Uh, someone else was leaning on the door jam on the other side, just in a very casual place. And they were close enough that I could have touched them. I didn't feel inclined to do that, but I could have. Uh, and we stood there for a moment and then one question was asked. And he asked me a very simple question and said, do you want to come home? And, um, you know, before we started, you ask about how you know things. I don't know. You know things. You know when you love someone. You know when you're angry. You know when you're frightened. And you can't bring someone a cup of fear or a tablespoon. We know there's neurochemistry involved and all that sort of thing. But I knew where I was, who I was talking to, and what the question meant in like a millionth of a second. There was no pressure to answer the question in any particular way, but I needed to answer the question. So it was a question that needed an answer. And so we talked for a while. I talked about what was going on in my life. I was building a very successful coaching practice. I'd had a very dramatic sort of life, decades of depression. I'd been a very high-ranking executive, been in and out of rehab, uh, drug addicts, behind the scenes, burned through relationships, kind of like movie stuff. This side is holy cow and the other side is holy crap. That was my life for a long time, decades. And I had changed that about 10 years before. I'd had a, an amazing and an astounding turnaround and began, I'd walked away from the other career and began to be a coach to help people understand their own opportunities and possibilities. I was really engaged in that work and felt like I had a lot left to do. There was no expectation. There was no fear. There was no negative emotion at all. It was just peace and a question. So after we talked for a while, I said, well, I'm not done. Okay. So that was the end of that conversation. Now the next day, and I have no idea how I knew it was the next day. It was the next day. I'm quite sure that when I made that decision, that's when they were able to restart my heart. The next day, uh, that conversation wasn't repeated. That question was decided and we were back at the door in the same place. And we had a additional conversation that's 
went around, what are you going to do? So he decided to stay. What are you going to do? And so we talked about the work that I was doing, coaching and helping people realize their true potential, that sort of thing. Uh, the conversation ended, but it ended with a finality that I knew we were finished. Two weeks later, I came out of a coma. They had eventually identified what I was infected with. And what they told me later was I was infected with a a strain of superbug, a necrotizing MRSA, which is a, an antibiotic resistant superbug, community acquired, there's a hospital acquired version and community, but the community acquired version is far worse. And the, the mortality rate of the infection that I had, the 10 day mortality rate was 100%. You know, so after talking to, to Kellen, I really felt like, well, maybe, Brian, that reality is reality. That consciousness is reality. I mean, who's to say that what he experienced isn't real? I wasn't there. You know, you weren't there. How do we know if he wasn't on some different level, which he, you know, feels he was? And, you know, that's it was a crazy story. It gave me goosebumps, actually, when we listened to it. But, you know, I'm, I'm just saying, like, whatever that was, it was some different level of consciousness, Right. right. Well, well, I mean, you, you got to think about it this way, right? If you're dreaming, you're feeling things, you're you're having memories, right? You you have sensations at that point in that state. So whatever that state is, whether you want to define it as consciousness or not consciousness, you're actually in some sort of reality for yourself. You know, maybe other people aren't connected to that reality, or maybe they are, right? Who's to say, you know, someone else somewhere in the world or somewhere in a different universe, you know, isn't having that same dream at the mm -hmm. same time that's connected to you, you know? I mean, there are a lot of people that believe there is this, you know, cosmic intelligence out there. I would like that. I always think about stuff like that. Like, is someone, like, can you connect your consciousnesses? <laughs> there, you know, can you connect with other people's consciousnesses? But, you yeah. know, I, I, especially, like, does the consciousness live inside of us? Or is it something that, you know, while you're a living creature, right, it's connected to you, and then it goes out into the ether, whatever, wherever that is. Because there's a lot of people that question is this, I'm just going to quote, is the soul or whatever we are, our essence really connected to our physical bodies or is it out there and it's just inhabiting them for the time being? I firmly believe that consciousness lives outside of the body. And I believe that there is a collective consciousness that we have called the quantum entanglement. And you can get into physics a little bit here, but I'll quickly get out of my realm because I'm not a physics major. But in that quantum entanglement, I believe that psychics and mediums are tapping into that collective consciousness that, again, lives outside the body. And there's a lot of different ways I could go here. One of them is, you know, do we tap into different dimensions? Are we reading people's minds? Are we reading their energy? Are we reading the collective consciousness? And I've delved into each one of those. Like, what am I really doing when I'm reading people or when I'm reading for their loved ones? And it's a question that I still have as to what it actually is. And I guess that's just the mystery that I'll live with. So when we think about consciousness and and the physical world, you know, there there were other, and we talked about all these philosophers who had these thoughts on reality. Um, I believe Immanuel Kant, and I forgive me if I'm not pronouncing that correctly, that is the correct pronunciation, Brian, is it? Mm -hmm. I think um, so. He, yeah. he was out there and he wanted to, to prove that the external physical world existed. And so that's kind of what we're talking about here too, you know, not only the different worlds in our minds, but like who's, to, we really started with the question of like, are we really here? Right, right, physically. Mm -hmm. And I, I think, you know, it was interesting what Kant was saying is really the physical world exists in sort of this linear time that, that human beings are used to. You know, right. things have a start and an end point, right? So mm -hmm. basically that sort of proves reality in a physical world. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, really once you get sort of beyond that, right? And this is sort of what we're talking about with consciousness. If there is some, you know, cosmic intelligence or cosmic consciousness or that consciousness is outside of us, right? Mm -hmm. What happens is that actually 
precedes time. And time is no longer linear, right? There's no necessarily start and end points. What happens is because if you think about space, right? You know, space is not linear. You know, you can move horizontally, you can move vertically, you can move up and down. And what happens is that really increases the field of where consciousness could be. It's not in a linear time frame, like like a living creature. So it's hard. It's hard to, there are a lot of doubts, right? And I think mm -hmm. we're always looking for um, physical answers to a lot of these questions that we have. And, and I think that's where we need to take a look at the science, you know, and of course these days that seems to be a buzzword, right? And let's look at the science, but you know, when you really look at the physical brain, where our thoughts come from, I think there's some answers there. So our, our brains actually ensure that our hearts beat and we breathe and, and they keep us alive. So, so the, the first answer is I know for a fact that there are structures in our brain that ensure we're alive. Our brain ensures our physical life, right? It ensures that we're breathing, that you know our heart is functioning, all those other things. And it, it's sort of like a giant storage piece also for all those memories, right? While we're in existence. But I think when you start looking at it at a higher level, right? If you if you go with the principle that everything's made of stardust or whatever the cosmos is made out of, right? Mm -hmm. You know, we're all made out of the same the same materials. So it's easy to see how you go from one network, right? Your brain, and people are trying to emulate this in computers, let's say, into this big giant cosmic network of information that's out there. You know, because if everything's created from the same stardust, obviously this these pieces exist elsewhere. But what happens if we damage our brain, right? If this consciousness doesn't just live inside of us, inside of our brains, and it lives outside of our brains, are we actually damaging consciousness, not just inside of us, but outside of us? I mean... I think that's a stretch. I, I do. I, I I tend to lean, you know, as out there and optimistic as I am, I, I tend to lean a lot toward the fact that like, if you damage your brain, doesn't that change what's going on in, in your life? I mean, if you're, let's say brain dead, mm -hmm. you, I, I don't know, does that change your, I guess that's a good question. I don't know. I just worked myself into a circle there. Right. So, I mean, it's it's sort of no different than asking if you're sleeping, is that sort of your reality at the time, right? If you're, whatever you have damage to your brain, is that just altering your consciousness, which is really altering reality or your reality? From an anatomical point of view, uh, we can do a brain scan and, and if there is uh, damage, we would call it a lesion, uh, to key areas of your brain, that tells us a lot, right? So um, back to kind of, you know, the core of your brain, uh, if you think of like an apple has flesh and then it has the core, the core of, of your brain, um, if you have damage, structural damage to that, that's likely going to kill you. Right, so you won't be breathing, you won't heart won't beating, um, won't be alive, and and there are actually there's interesting areas in in that area. We we talk about it in terms of um, your brain stem and uh, and and your midbrain area, um, where if you receive a, a particular damage in a particular area, you can actually it can alter your consciousness. So you can um, you can have damage in your brain that will create uh, what we call a vegetative state. Um, so we do have spectrum of what's called disorders of consciousness, where you can go from kind of um, a coma to uh, being in a vegetative state or a persistent vegetative state to minimally conscious uh, to um, what we call locked in, where you're actually completely conscious, but you are unable to communicate with the outside world. I guess one way you might be able to look at the fact that we have different levels of consciousness, even from a scientific perspective, and this is something we spoke with the neuroscientist about, I think it was it was really important for me to hear him talk about um, recalling memories. And he talks about our brain being an information processor. That really st struck home for me because, you know, when you, um, and we've done episodes of this, right? We did an episode mm -hmm. on smell in the past mm -hmm. on the Insomnicat show and how you can recall a memory. Mm -hmm. and, and it's almost like you're actually not physically, but you're actually going to that place in time when you spark that memory. So mm -hmm. could you transport yourself back and forth through different consciousnesses? Well, the way I think of consciousness is actually um, 
you know, think about memories, for example, right? Like if you have this, um, if, if your brain is, your brain is an information processor and it pulls in information and that information actually um, informs these neural connections. Um, so we talk about uh, the neurons that fire together, wire together, right? So a- as you experience an event that actually modifies the neural connections and the neural networks. And so if you sort of stand back and even on the internet, you can see kind of these amazing pictures of neural networks firing and these patterns. I think the concept is that these patterns aren't necessarily random, right? So those are, you know, for example, if you activate a a pattern, um, and we've all experienced this, imagine, for example, you smell uh, like a perfume or a cologne and, and it brings back a memory, right? And you're like, wow, I feel like I'm right there. You've created an activation within and a pattern of activation within that neural network that reactivated that that state and that presence and that consciousness, um, independent of time in that instance, right? Right. Well, I mean, that's you know, that's also when we start talking about you know, when we, if we go back to talking about life is linear, right? Mm-hmm. If you're able to recall something that happened in the past, or you know have feelings about the future, right? That actually takes it outside of being linear right there alone, you know, because it's pulling it from not that linear path. So yeah, absolutely. If you could recall something, is is that part of reality or you're envisioning things? I mean, the same thing goes with creativity, Mm -hmm. right? If you're pulling things from different places to create, are you pulling them from other realities? So, you know, we've done a lot of um, out there thinking so far. We talked about, you know, near-death experiences and unconscious states and, you know, aliens, you know, what is that? Alien Ant Alien Ant Farm. Alien Ant Farm. You know, and and it's fun to think about that. You know, for me personally, I get excited when I think about that in some weird way. Um, But, you know, some philosophers might argue that we actually just need to accept our reality. You know, like, let's just accept the fact that we're alive and stop focusing on all this other craziness um, and yeah. questioning our reality. You know, I, I think it was, uh, I think it was Miyamoto Musashi in the book of Five Rings who said the purpose of today's training is to defeat tomorrow's understanding, right? So basically, you know, it's sort of like you're here in that present time. And that's what you have to look at, not worrying about other stuff. Well, I think the other the other thing is when you start over questioning it, um, right? What happens is you're not focused on almost achieving anything in it, right? That may be meaningful to your current state or whatever. You you get my point. Like you start hyper-focusing on just wondering if it's real and getting to that ultimate question versus actually making things real, right? So, you know, Mm -hmm. we can talk about reality versus manifestation, which I think is sort of where we started. You know, a lot of times, you know, you have to create things like you could think about it all you want, but if you don't actually sit there and go and, and do... Eventually, uh-huh. nothing happens, right? So wh- <laughs> where's the reality in that? There are many people out there who are peddling the idea that almost everything you know about reality is is wrong and you sh- um, and that we should be cynical and skeptical of so much of what the establishment is peddling because it's all a big lie. Um, that is such a hugely damaging message. Because it's making, instead of saving people, instead of freeing people, it makes them fearful, it makes them reactive, it, it, it's damaging mental immune systems. Uh, and we don't have to, I, I mean, part of it is the media environment, right? You, you Many media sources actually try, need to sell the idea that Oh my God! This is an existential. This is this story is of existential significance, in order to compete for attention in this environment. But when every single story basically tries to sell itself as as critical to our survival, people get overwhelmed and people overreact and people shut down and people um, give up on institutions that have served us really well for a long, long time. So, so my advice would be. Don't be too quick to assume that everything you know about reality is wrong. It's almost always 
an overreaction when you indulge in doubts that run that deep. You'll very likely um, do damage to your own ability to discern fact from fiction if you go down that path. I think one of the, I don't know, soul crushing things that I heard of as we were talking about different philosophers, was, it was uh, Albert Camus. And to your point about, um, you know, creating meaning, on the other hand, he talks about, um, you know, embracing the meaninglessness of our own lives. And, you know, I say all the time, like, it just is what it is, you know, like mm -hmm. not everything has a reason, you know, and mm -hmm. I, I waffle. Sometimes I do. Like, sometimes I think everything has a reason. And sometimes I think nothing has a reason. Like it just is like, just mm -hmm. go, you know? And, and if we create all this mumbo jumbo, like, oh, we're controlled by aliens and stuff. And, mm -hmm. and we're kind of removing and detaching ourselves from the very life that could give us some meaning. Does that make sense? Yeah. I feel yeah. really trippy right now. Yeah. 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 I, I, I agree. I mean, I think that's, that's why, uh, that's why the, the old adage that simplifies it, I think therefore I am like, just puts you in existence, right? <laughs> yeah. Like that puts you in reality. If you're thinking and you're processing you, you are, and, and it just makes it really simple for people to really grasp. Okay. I, I am alive and I need to go and accomplish whatever <laughs> my goal mm -hmm. is to accomplish. It just is what it is. You know, not yeah. everything has this giant answer, but, but to, I'm going to play devil's advocate here just because we think therefore we are, and that's how we're thinking right now, or the brain may show us something today. It doesn't mean that that's still going to be the case tomorrow. You know, I, I really believe that everything is just kind of moving. So, you, you know, what we believe today may not be tomorrow, you know? Yeah, well, and I, I think that's sort of, you know, if we look back at what Socrates was saying, you know, it's it's always changing, right? It's mm -hmm. always changing. That reality is always changing. So as you're moving through this world or these planes of existence or wherever mm -hmm. you are, right, that reality is always changing for you and, and probably for other people you're interacting with on that path at that time. Mm -hmm. There's just nothing in our world that says that we're always going to be this way, that we won't wake up tomorrow and figure out that we're actually not existing physically. You know, there is nothing to say right now. As much evidence as you can find in the brain, as many people as we've spoken to over the past episode, you know, it just, right. there's nothing to say that we won't come to this conclusion one day that we are actually like living in the matrix. Right. With yeah. Keanu Reeves. With Keanu Reeves. So regardless of whether you're with Keanu Reeves or not Keanu Reeves, I think the reality of your situation is you need to figure out what you want your reality to be, focus on that, work on that, and move towards your higher goals. Mm-hmm.